So as we take a look at each of these, that first one, x plus x times 10. Now, what do I do first when I'm actually doing this math? Do I do the addition first or do I do the multiplication first? Well, of course, multiplication comes first. So it might be easier for you to look at it like this, x plus 10x. And of course, x plus 10x, that's like 1x plus 10x's, it equals 11x. And we can do the exact same thing with all the other ones as well. So if you take a look at that next one, x plus x times 0.1. Well, it's like you got 1x plus 0.1x's. Well, what's 1 plus 0.1? Just 1.1, yeah. Now, the brain bender is that we can actually do it also when it's not an x, but also just a number in there. Because notice, the 500 is in the exact same spot as the x was in the first ones. So, I can just, instead of having to do this as two separate calculations, instead of having to do 500 plus the 500 times 10, I could just have done 500 times 11. Or... This should now start seeming like a familiar type of calculation based on the work we did yesterday. 500 plus 500 times 0.1. Yesterday's work, we always had to do that in multiple steps. But here, we can see that we actually could do that just as 500 times 1.1. And we're going to be using this kind of a skill here a little bit later on. Because yesterday, we saw how to do a problem like this. So we have a stock that's increasing in value by an average of 10% each year. We're buying $500 of this stock, and we want to know how much it's going to be worth in two years. And so this is the work that we end up doing. So I started by going up by 10% each year. I started by figuring out what is 10% of my 500. So I did 500 times 0.1, because of course I take my 10% and write it as a decimal. And that gave me 50. That told me that in the first year, I went up by $50. Hence, I have to do 500 plus the 50. But for the next year, I have to figure out what 10% is of the 550. Because notice it's not just $50 every year. That amount changes. In fact, the second year, you can see we get $55. And so then I take what I had at the start of the year, the 550, and I add the 55 to that. And so we would end up that year with $605. And so we can do this for two years. Okay, fairly straightforward, I hope, here. But now, what if we look at this problem now? Same basic setup except for one difference. We want to figure out what's it going to be after 10 years. So that means... We have to take the calculations that we've done, but we got to do it 10 times instead of twice. Well, we've already done it twice, but if we keep going with this and look to see what it's going to do, here's what it would look like for the first five years. So we're only halfway there at this point. But notice that as we're going down this work, the number here keeps having more and more decimals in it. And the further down we go, the more decimals we're going to have to be keeping track of in order to avoid rounding error. It's going to get very challenging to work with this. And plus, it's just tedious doing all of these steps every single time. And so today, our big goal is being able to take this kind of a process and simplify it down. So taking a look at what we did for that first year, notice rather than writing it as two separate steps over here, we can do like what we did on that first set of problems that I had up at the start of this lesson, which was we can combine that into a single step. Now, why can we do that? Because this 50 that I add, that's just 500 times 0.1. So I can just rewrite it as the 500 plus whatever 500 times 0.1 gives us. By writing it just on one line, we can make our life a lot easier because now instead of having to do two things every year, we're now doing just one thing each year. All I'm having to do is multiply it by 1.1. And so I can take all of these over here and change the way they're written. Okay? 
instead of going through the process of saying, multiply it by 0.1, and then add that to the original, we can just do this. We can multiply the original amount by 1.1. The basic idea behind it, what's happening, the reason why it works, is because this one here represents our original starting value. So we have the whole plus the 10%. So that work that we used to have, we used to have five different years of data, but we had to do two steps for each one. Now I can get the exact same numbers over here as I did before, but by just multiplying each one by 1.1. This is now a lot easier to go out to 10, right? Because like on your calculator, you can just do 500 times 1.1 and get that number. Then you can multiply that by 1.1, and that by 1.1, that by 1.1, and that by 1.1, and we can keep going and going and going until we've done it 10 times. This is a much easier method to do than what we were doing originally, right? But we still actually have a bit of a pain here. There's still a, a way that we can simplify this process. So rather than having to press equal so many times on our calculator, if we're just multiplying the last number by 1.1, it's kind of like I could write it all out in one big ugly line like this, where I'm doing 500 times 1.1, times 1.1, times 1.1, times 1.1, but there's a much shorter way to write it. Because I multiplied it by 1.1 10 times. What's a shorter way to write 1.1 times itself 10 times? Yeah, this is why exponents exist. So we don't have to press equal so many times on our calculator. I could rewrite it instead as 1.1 to the power of 10. And so all of that work that we had to do really long ways, we actually could shorten into just one little calculation here. I can do 500 times 1.1 to the power of 10. Now, of course, when you do that calculation, remember order of operations, do the exponent first, so 1.1 to the power of 10, and then multiply it by the 500. And as you can see, it gives us the exact same answer as what we got when we did it the long way. So thank goodness it's a lot shorter. Now, I want to keep using this same basic idea. So I'm going to give you some different problems here where we change just one of the things at a time. Next up. This is the same scenario, except instead of 10 years, I want to go for 20 years. Write out the equation that you would use for this scenario, please. All right, so in the last problem, we had this as our equation. We had 500 times 1.1 to the 10th. What is going to become the 20 in this case? What is changing to be 20 now? It's the 10. I didn't change the percent, so we didn't need to mess around with the percent related stuff. I didn't change the original amount, I only changed the number of years. So then it just becomes 500 times 1.1 to the 20th. And so that would be our answer. We could figure it out for 20 years later just by making that one little change. All right, now this one is the same as the last one we did, except I changed one thing. I changed the $500 to be $300. So. What will that change? Write out what that one will look like now. So in the last one, we had this equation, 500 times 1.1 to the 20. What am I going to change to be the 300 in this case? 500. Yep, the 500. And so we can see that that original amount, that's whatever that number is. It's hanging out. And so this is the calculation I would do in that case. I'd do 300 times 1.1 to the 20th. Okay, so, <laughs> so now we're going to change the part that's probably the most confusing, though, in the whole thing. Now we're going to look at what happens when we change the percent. So take a moment, write out what you think it would be, and then we'll go through it together and see why. All right, so this was our equation from the last problem. Remember, we're changing one thing. 
we need to now make it, instead of 10%, we need to make it 11%. Well, we've already seen the 300 changes with this number. And the 20, the years, is this number. So it definitely must be this 1.1 that's affected, right? What's it going to become instead? Well, in order to get the 1.1, I got that because I did 1 plus 10% as a decimal, but 10% as a decimal is 0 0.1. Where did the plus 1 What is 11% as a decimal? Okay. It's 0 0.11, right? So instead of 1.1, it's going to be 1.11, 1 1.11. Now, why do we have to do this whole plus 1 thing though, right? That's really the question, why do we have to have the 1.1? Well, think about, if I multiply 300, if I multiply it by just the 0.11, I get a really small number, right? Uh, I get like uh, 33 in this case. But that 33 isn't my ending amount. I have to go back and do 300 plus... 33. Or in other words, I had to do the original amount, which is 300 times 1, plus my new amount, which was the 300 times the 0.11. Now, if you want another way to see this, we can actually factor 300 out of that line. It's 300 times 1 plus 0.11. And so, if we change the percent to 12%, notice it's 1.12. That's the only change we need to make there, is we're just changing that decimal after the 1. And so if it's 9%, notice we end up with 1.09. Because 9%, remember, if I take 9%, turn it into a decimal, that is 0.09. Last one we're going to practice here together, what would it be for 5%? All right, and so if we do it with 5%, of course 5% is a decimal point zero 0.05, and so we end up with 1.05. Now, if this whole thing about adding 1, you're still trying to figure out why? Well, the good news is you don't have to memorize why for every single one of them. I'm going to give you a formula. This formula is going to need to go into your notes. Now, notice I left some space around it here. Oh Leave that space around it on your paper, because I'm going to also include notes here in a moment about what each of these letters represent. But I want you to get the formula down first. Now, let's take a look at what all this stuff means. First of all, on the left-hand side, we start with A parentheses T. Remember, this is function notation. So what this really represents is the value of A at T. So it's just a matter of, okay, what would A mean then? Well, whenever we've done these calculations, it's told us how much is it actually worth after a certain amount of time. So that's going to be like our final amount that's in there. And I'll, I'll formalize this. I'll put up notes that you can write down here in a moment. Uh, the P. Well, that's that number that's always multiplied out front. Remember in all those equations we just worked through, that number that was multiplied out front was always our starting value. And so this is going to end up being our starting value here as well. And notice in our formula, here's that 1 plus coming in again. Now, R though, remember that R, that number that I'm adding in there, it was always a decimal. Because I always had to take the percent and write it as a decimal. So this would be a great way to summarize what each of those letters represent. So add this information around that formula so that you'll always remember what everything means as we go start plugging into it. So yesterday, we were able to dig in a lot into different types of investments and talk about a lot of those things. For finishing out this class, we're going to be using that formula that we just found with some real world situations. And so what I did is I went out and I actually looked up what were the numbers for Microsoft stock at various years 
So then we could see how this formula would apply to Microsoft stock. Now, Microsoft stock in the 90s was the stock. I also like using Microsoft because it's a local company. And a lot of our families are associated with Microsoft in some way. We might work there, something like that. So, Microsoft from 1990 to the year 2000, it went up by an average of 58.1% per year. That is considered outrageously good. This is not average. This is way above average. This made people a lot of money. Okay? Now, let's say we took $100 in 1990 and put it into Microsoft stock. What would that stock have been worth 10 years later in order to figure that out? We can use that formula that you just put into your notes. So take a moment, write out what that equation would look like, and then calculate your value, please. All right, so to start with, what do each of those letters represent? So what is P, what is R, what is T? P is our principal. It's our starting amount. That's our $100. That's what we put in at the very start here. R, this is the one that can sometimes be tricky. R is not 58.1. R is 0 0.5. 581. Because remember, R needs to be as a decimal. So we take our percent and we turn it into a decimal, like divide by 100. And then T is how many years we're leaving it there. It's going to be 10 years. So when you plug it all into that equation, this is what you should be looking at. Now do the calculation. Now, if you do that calculation correctly, you're going to start by adding the numbers inside the parentheses. So we get 1.581, and we're going to do that to the power of 10. Then multiply it by 100, and we get $9,757.05. So we gave up $100, and we got back almost $10,000. Nice. This is a good deal, right? This is why Microsoft going up by 58.1% per year was so outrageously good. It made a lot of people a lot of money, right? So... So that is exactly what happened based on the numbers from the year 1990 to the year 2000. And then what happened is people said, wow, Microsoft keeps going up outrageously. It's made up a lot of millions. So in the year 2000, I'm going to go ahead and buy myself some Microsoft stock so I can be a millionaire too. And so at that point, what would it have been worth later? Well, let's see what they're expecting to happen. We have our $100, and we're going to leave it in there for another 10 years because we want to know what it's worth in 2010. What am I going to change for my last equation? The time, yeah. What's my time going to now be? 20. And so we're going to be doing this. Now, when we do that calculation, we should get this, $952,000.99. Can't forget the 99 cents, right? <laughs> and so this is what people were seeing happening. They were like, wow, for the first 10 years, this thing's gone through the roof. It's going to go up to like a million. My $100 is going to turn into a million if I get in on this. So the question is, did that really happen? And as you can probably guess, there was a little hitch in this plan. Was it in 2008? From the year 2000 to the year 2010, on average, Microsoft stock actually decreased in value by 6.1% each year. So let's say that that person who had put in their $100 at the start, they ended up with $9,757.05. They have that sitting in their stock, and they leave it between 2000 and 2010. What will they actually have 10 years later? Well, this one's got a little complexity in the equation, though, right? Because we can know to set up this much. Although I notice a typo in here. This shouldn't be a 20 because we're only going to have this in there for 10 years. But we've got to change things up a little bit because we're decreasing, right? So the decrease changes what happens inside the parentheses. It's like our rate of change has now become 
negative. And so instead of it being plus the minus. point zero six one, we're going to do minus that point zero six one. Okay, so when we do that calculation, we do the one minus point zero six one. When we do that, that gives us 0.939, and I raise that to the power of 10. That gives us $5,199.65. So the person who put in $100 way back in 1990, it grew to almost 10000 Then over the next decade, it shrunk down to just over 5000 If the person didn't watch the stock the whole time, if they didn't see what it was worth, in the year 2000, they put in $100, and 20 years later, they had over 5000 Are they still feeling okay about that? Yes. yes. That still worked out to be really good. But if you're watching it every day, your heart rate starts going up a little bit in uh, like 2001, right? But can't you take and so you can watch those things, but the trouble that people run into <laughs> is they see, oh, no, my stock went down a little bit. And they take it out. By the way, the graph that you see here behind it, that's the actual graph of what Microsoft stock was doing at that time. And so what some people do is they bail. They're like, oh, no, it's going down. It's going to keep going down. So then they sell it like here. Well, they sold it. And, yeah, they're, they still made a little bit of money compared to when they first put it in. But they didn't write it out. And you'll notice that even though it went down there at the start, it then continued going up again. It recovered over time. If every time it starts going down, you're like, oh no, it's going to keep going down, you're going to freak out, and you're going to be too reactionary, and you're always going to sell it when it's low, instead of selling it when it's high. What you actually want to do is you want to look for when it's going up, and sell it then, if you're looking for a good time to sell it. But even better, invest it, and then forget you have it until it's time to pull it out when you like retire or whatever it is. So last thing is, we did all those calculations, but just kind of some perspective on stocks in general. Individually, individual stocks, as you saw here, they can wildly increase and decrease in value. So an individual stock, it's hard to track it and know whether it's going to be going up or down. Remember yesterday we were talking about, like, I want to save up money for two years so I can buy a car with it? Your stocks are going to be going up and down so much that it's probably not the place to keep that because it might go down just as much as it would go up. So some general strategies for buying stocks and investing is diversify your investments. So when you hear people talk about a diversified portfolio or something like that, this is what they're talking about. They're saying buy stocks from many different companies, not just one. That way, you know, Microsoft went down, but Apple went up. We're still doing okay. That sort of thing. And that's what was happening during that 2000 to 2010 range. People who had both, they averaged out really nice. Also, buy stocks from companies in different industries. So like you might buy some tech stocks. And you might like have some manufacturing stocks or some real estate stocks. So that way, you know, like... Uh, some of you may recall people talk about the dot-com bubble that burst. Basically, people had dumped tons and tons of money into uh, lots of tech stocks. They got overinflated, and then all of a sudden, they lost a ton of their value almost overnight. People who had only put their money in tech stocks took a big hit. People who had some tech stocks and some manufacturing stocks, well, they were okay because, yeah, a little bit of it went down, but the rest of it was still doing what it was always doing. Also, buy stocks from different size companies. Little companies tend to go up and down a lot and buy big amounts. Big companies, they are kind of your slow and steady. You want to mix those up a little bit so you have a chance for some big returns from little companies, but if they all go sour, you're still covered with the big companies. And even... Buy some stocks from different countries. Buy some international stocks. Now, I'm not saying spread it equally so you have a stock from every single country. But 
while you might have most of your portfolio from the US, you'll also have some for companies that are like in China or Japan or India or Europe, any of those other places that are kind of moving along. That way, like if something happens to the US economy, you are still having something to mitigate those effects. So you're always wanting to diversify as much as possible for that reason. Um, and one last thing here that we'll talk about here, uh, you'll hear people often talk about the market and what the market did on any given day. What they're usually talking about is actually a market index. Usually what they're actually referencing is the Dow Jones. The Dow Jones is just a collection of 30 different stocks that they put those values all together and then they can describe, okay, how's the market doing based on these 30? Because the, the other stocks tend to do what these 30 do. But of course, 30 is a fairly small number. And so you also have like the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ index has 3,300 stocks in it. So that gives you a really wide view about what might be happening in that particular market. Or there's also the S&P, the Standard & Poor 500 index which has 500 companies in it. In fact, the 500 largest publicly traded US companies. And so by looking at those or investing in a diverse group of stocks, you can see here, these are the graphs of Microsoft since it started up to today versus the Dow Jones over that same time. You notice Microsoft, it's a little spikier, a little bit more up and down, or if I over them, Here's Microsoft in blue and the Dow Jones in red. You can see Microsoft went higher at times, but it also went lower at times. And so the more stocks you have involved, the better your average tends to be. But of course, by taking the safer route, sometimes you miss out on maybe those really big wins. For instance, notice here, Microsoft was up and down a whole lot over this particular time period, but you'll notice its high is still outperforming the high of the Dow Jones. But that's because it just happens to be today that I'm looking at the data. If I looked at the same data back here in like 2013, I'd be coming to a different conclusion. And so you're always wanting to take a look at how much volatility are you willing to absorb over time.